Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Love Daily for March 19th, 2018. On today's show, we're going to dive into the water cooler and talk about some news. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is senior writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. So, guys, join me by the virtual water cooler, and let's talk about what we've been up to. Uh, I just returned from Seattle. Uh, where I was attending the wedding of Dave Chen and his new wife, um, which was wonderful. I talked about that on uh, an episode of the Slash Filmcast. One of the, I mean, actually, the first episode of the Slash Filmcast recorded in one room together, which is kind of crazy because that's been going on for what almost 10 years now <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah uh so uh you, you can go over there and hear that but I, I will say it was beautiful it took place at a movie theater in seattle uh on the walls of the movie theater were all these posters that they photoshopped dave and uh his wife into and uh, it was actually kind of funny because i walked into the movie theater and i i just walked by the posters and was around the posters for like maybe 10 minutes before i realized they were photoshopped into the posters, like because they're like iconic posters, like Mad Max Fury Road and Sleepless in Seattle and stuff like that. So, uh, like you know, it, just giving them a glance on th- the side of your eye, you're like, oh, that's just you know a Sleepless in Seattle poster. It's not Sleepless in Seattle with uh, Dave Chen in it. But uh, uh, it was interesting. But I did want to say that, um, guys, Seattle is the city of the future. Okay. Uh, while I was in Seattle, I went to the Amazon Go store. Have Have either of you heard about this? I have heard about it. I've never seen or been to one, though. Yeah, I think there's only one in Seattle right now. I think they're kind of like beta testing it. And what it is, is you download this Amazon Go app. If you're a Prime member, which I assume probably most people listening to this are, um, you download the Amazon Go uh, app, and it gives you like a QR code. And when you walk into the store, you scan the QR code. And uh, it's kind of like one of those things I assume are probably in New York City where, like, you know, the gate opens when you scan, like, your ticket kind of thing. Um, And um, so you go into this store. It's a grocery store. And you basically can grab a bag or you can – if you have a backpack, you can just grab things off the shelf, put them into your bag. And there's cameras all in the ceiling tracking everybody in the store. And basically you just walk out. Like there's no checkout, there's no scanning, there's uh, there's no uh, um, what do you call those NFC chips in like the items. It's literally all based on cameras, and you know while you're walking out of the store, you get a notification on your phone like, oh, you got charged, you know, three dollars for this cupcake or or whatever. And uh, it's also interesting because if you go into the store with like a friend who's not an Amazon Prime member, and like they're your guest into the store, like anything that they take is charged to you. So it's it's uh wow. yeah it's crazy it is the store of the future like there was like two people like waiting by the exit and th- those were the two only two employees I saw in the store and I I just can't uh I, I guess the future is going to be like without cashiers and you just go into a store and you just put things into your bag it, it it's it's kind of crazy and um I did want to say on, on the way to the Amazon store we were uh it was like a two mile trip from um the hotel we were in and uh we saw these bikes all uh along the sidewalks where we were walking and um i know in la uh, i'm not sure about uh i'm wondering if you have this in uh philly chris but um in la we have like these bike systems where like there's these bikes that you can rent that are like in these hubs but basically you gotta like sign up for the subscription with your phone and it's like this big complicated process where like when you take the bike, you got to return it to one of the other hubs in, in the system. And it's uh, I found as a person without a car in L.A., I found that it's very inconvenient uh, because it, those hubs are never any place you actually want to go. Um, but in Seattle, they, they have the system without hubs that basically you just download the app, you scan the bike, the bike unlocks and. Uh, through your Apple Pay or whatever you have on your phone, charges you a dollar per hour of you using the bike. Uh, it has GPS on every one of the bikes, so you can like pull up the app and see where the nearest bikes are near you. But like these bikes are everywhere in, around Seattle, um, and uh, when you get to your destination, you just you know leave it on the sidewalk. Uh, it you know you press the button, it automatically locks. No one can use it unless they have the app, and uh, it's I don't know. I, I was I was 
very impressed by the system. Um, however, Dave Chen and a lot of people in Seattle, I think, do not like these bikes all over the place because they're they're all neon colored, so that you see them from far away, um, and they think it's an eyesore. But I, I don't know. I thought it was it was kind of uh, crazy and incredible. Um, and I also visited the uh, Museum of Pop Culture, which is uh, Paul Allen's museum. Paul Allen is one of the guys that started Microsoft, and um, as you can imagine, is very very rich. Rich enough that he, you know, bought tons and tons of movie props and built a museum just to house his movie prop collection. And it's some of the, like, most amazing movie props in the history of, uh, you know, cinema and television. And actually, it does music and video games as well. Um, but uh, if you go to my Instagram feed, you can see some photos I took there. But uh, they, they just have everything. They have stuff from Star Wars to, you know, a princess bride to game of thrones to you know uh, uh lord of the rings like everything um it's 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 pretty incredible but um but yeah i'm now back in la for 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 a little while uh ben what have you been up to uh well speaking of los angeles here in hollywood uh, warner brothers has opened a ready player one challenge and that is at the corner of hollywood and vine and it's available and free to the public right now uh, from today until April 1st of this year. And it is essentially, uh, the corner of Hollywood and Vine is normally just a parking lot. It's just empty, an empty space. And now there are there is a massive recreation of the stacks, which are the one of the settings, or is one of the settings in Ready Player One. It's essentially a bunch of, uh, of like... What would you even call them? Like um, shipping container. It's like a yeah, vertical like, R- like RVs trailer park. almost. Yeah, yeah, like trailer park. Exactly, a vertical trailer park. Um, so there's this huge construction thing, and just like sitting there on this corner, and you go in, and it's actually a detailed, super intricate maze. So mirroring the plot of the movie, you have to track down these three keys in order to unlock this Easter egg at the end of the maze. And each room in the maze is sort of themed um, appropriately to, you know, there are sections of it that look just like the main character's room in the film. And then there are other rooms within this maze that are sort of more generically Uh, pop culture themed like one of them looks like a giant rubik's cube there are um, rooms with huge mirrors everywhere and all these neon lights it's very like instagram friendly i saw tons of people taking pictures and all of that stuff i know it's going to be like a huge deal on social media i'm sure Um, and it has a delorean there that you can actually sit in Uh, i don't know if it's like a real 100 percent true delorean or just like a uh, sometimes they make like fiberglass versions of those vehicles that aren't you know, straight off the uh, the yeah. manufacturing line, but you know they're they're altered to look like one. Either way, it looks really cool, um, just like it does in the film. And uh, and yeah, I mean, it's a really really cool place. And if you're even remotely interested in Ready Player One, and you're in Los Angeles, go check it out. It's free. You can go to ReadyPlayerOneChallenge.com and reserve a time um, to to stop by and check it out. You can. Go through the maze at your own pace. Um, you can you can like race through it, or really like stop and pay attention to every little detail. Uh, they have a a pop up hot topic there selling Ready Player <laughs> One stuff as well. Um, but it's really cool because you get to going through the maze. You get to unlock three keys by sort of searching for them. It's almost like an escape room vibe, um, but not nearly as intense because there's like I said, there's no time. Uh, element to it so you just sort of wander around you can find you once you find a key you get a uh like a black light stamp on your uh wrist and then once you have all three you get to um show it to this guard who's dressed up like one of the villains in the movie and he unlocks a door for you and takes you into the room with an easter egg and it's got like all the props and stuff from the movie in there um i took a bunch of footage uh, a bunch of video when i was there so i'm going to try to cut it all together uh and write that up and and put it up on slash sometime later this week so stay tuned for that it's uh sort of similar to what warner brothers did with the it house back when that movie came out last year um where they just took over this whole area and built this massive i mean they must have spent so much money on this stuff but it, it's it's very cool so yeah, i hope it works and we, we, we had uh, someone who wrote into the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I can't find the email right now, but a, a couple of weeks ago when, when Jacob was talking about the Westworld experience at South by Southwest, and, and the person, the reader, 
I will find his name uh, after I ask you the question. Uh, basically, asked like you know what does what do these installations do? Like, are people that are experiencing these installations people that wouldn't have seen this movie or wouldn't have watched Westworld series uh, season two? Like, what what is the purpose of these installations? Do you yeah, have any I, theories? I, I think it's just a straight marketing thing. I, I think it's it's a way to get. Uh, it's just like you know, they've got money to burn and they're looking to make it an interactive experience for people and pull people in to, you know, something that is personalized. And like I said, there are tons of like photo ops and stuff so that every time somebody posts a picture of it, you're, you know, theoretically getting in front of that person's entire, you know, everybody who follows them on Instagram or whatever. So um, I think it's just a, a, pretty smart marketing tactic and yeah there there's like a huge billboard for it and like the whole thing is very noticeable when you're driving through downtown hollywood it's it's just yeah. like you know enormous sort of rising up out of this parking lot so i, I think it's just a yeah just an effective marketing tactic and it was slash from uh daily read uh, listener uh ben benjamin sandy who wrote in and i think you make a good point it's not about the the actual few people that get to experience these installations it's it's about all you know the the buzz that's created from that the instagram postings the videos you know all over my twitter feed i know mm-hmm. i have i have like a, my a lot of people on my twitter feed are like film twitter anyways so i'm getting like the, a lot of the people that go to this kind of thing but uh i imagine that you know videos and photos from that westworld experience we're getting a lot of range um, out of South by. Um, so I'm sure, you know, people that have never seen Westworld would see those and be like, Oh, maybe I got to check out Westworld on HBO. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, let's dive into the news. Black Panther, which is just doing insane business at the box office. Uh, when I was in Seattle, I got to see it at the Cinerama in Seattle, which is just so much better than our cinerama here in LA. It, it's incredible. Um, but uh, Black Panther uh, was the first movie since Avatar to top the box list five straight weeks in a row. Ben, tell us about it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Black Panther made $27 million this past weekend. So like you said, it's now the first film since Avatar in 2009 uh, to hit the top of the box office for five weeks straight. So that is uh, super impressive for this movie. And it uh, is also only the seventh film in history to cross the $600 million uh, mark at the North American box office. So right now the film is sitting at uh, $605 million. Um, that puts it at number seven on the all-time domestic the highest grossing list. And uh, the next significant mountain for it to climb would be to beat the Avengers, which is sort of uh, sitting at the number five spot right now with $623 million. So that seems very, very plausible for it to be able to do that. And if it does, that would make Black Panther the highest grossing Marvel movie ever made. So uh, that's pretty easily achievable. And I think that's probably going to happen within the next couple weeks. Uh, the question then becomes like how far does this go uh, what where is it going to end up on this all-time list um my guess is it's probably going to end up beating jurassic world and titanic uh and s- ultimately end up in a in third place behind uh star wars the force awakens which is sitting at the number one spot with 936 million domestic which is just like almost unsurpassable i can't imagine anything coming that close to that again and then avatar is number two with 760 million so uh black panther would have to do a a hell of a lot more business to top that but i do think it, it could probably end up passing titanic which is sort of insane um but uh but yeah very possible and at the box office, it has been quite a surprise because there was uh, a movie on the, in, in the top of the box office this weekend that I had never even heard of. And uh, as someone who writes about film, that is not something that happens uh, very often. Chris, tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, when I wrote this story up for SlashFilm.com, I said the same exact thing, Peter. I said, you know, I write about movies for a living. I have never heard of this film. But this is a uh, a faith based film from Roadside Attract- Attractions. It's based on a song by a uh, a Christian band called Mercy Me, who I I've never heard of them. But um, this film, the Roadside Attractions, they were predicting they'd only make about two million dollars for the opening weekend, but they ended up making seventeen point one million dollars. 
at 1,629 locations in North America, which ended up putting this third at the box office behind Black Panther and Tomb Raider. So this film that you know pretty much no one has heard of has somehow done really well at the box office. It beat you know a wrinkle in time on its second week out, and that's you know that's a huge Disney movie, and yet this film did better than that uh, over the weekend. So. Now, 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 do you think is, this is something we could see have legs, or do you think this is just a bunch of church groups buying out, you know, uh, bulk tickets for their entire congregation to go see this movie? I mean, th- that's one of the factors that made it a hit was literally church groups, you know, going in droves to see it. I don't know if that's something they're going to keep up, you know, if they're going to plan to do that every weekend. I really don't know. I mean, uh, Roadside Attractions is now planning to add this to 2000 more screens uh, for the, you know, the upcoming weekend. So I guess we'll see. I mean, again, I've, I've never heard of this, so (laughs) I don't know if it's going to keep having, you know, box office legs, but I guess we'll see. We will have to see uh, how far you can imagine with that movie. Um, But let's move on to uh, black Panther. You mentioned Ben that, you know, this is going to overtake the Avengers. I I think it's going to overtake it this week, probably judging by, uh, the box office, um, mm-hmm. at least what they're taking in daily. Uh, you know, this has become a mega hit for Disney and, um, a lot of people in the theme park world, uh, I'm a big fan of the Disney theme parks, are wondering, you know, when is Black Panther going to come to the theme parks? Uh, they do have a Black Panther meet and greet in uh, Disney California Adventure, which started on the day the movie came out, which is pretty cool. But, uh, you know, walking out of that film, I think everybody was talking about, wow, the world building in this film. I want to go visit Wakanda. And so so much so that actually... Um, there has been some news reports that uh, travel websites are seeing a 700% increase in people, people searching for the travel destination Wakanda for <laughs> air flights and stuff. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I know Wakanda does not exist. But uh, coming out of the movie theater, I was like, you know, I would love for Disney Parks to create a Wakanda, maybe in like uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom, because, you know, it's, it's uh, Wakanda surrounded by nature. And it also has uh, Animal Kingdom has a part of the park that a land in the park that's based on Africa. So um, maybe it, it could go there. Uh, there has been some rumors that have popped up. I, I wrote about this on slash on the com that uh, that Disney could be planning to bring Black Panther to Epcot. And these spawned because um, a uh, couple weeks back in February, uh, some people spotted uh, Bob Chapek and a team of executives and Imagineers taking a look at, uh, one of the, uh, pavilions at Epcot. Uh, Bob Chapek is the chairman of the parks and, uh, he was looking at the, the wonders of life pavilion. And, uh, for those of you who don't know at Epcot, there's, you know, the wonders of life pavilion is a place that, uh, it hasn't really been used for a long time. It opened in 1989. It's been shut down since 2007. And it's basically been used. Uh, Epcot occasionally has these um, festivals, like a wine, uh, food and wine festival. And it's, it's used for like uh, seminars and stuff like that. At the But most of the year, it's used for nothing. And it used to host uh, a bunch of like it used to host this like a uh, body war simulator ride where you'd get put into someone's body almost like uh that movie uh and um a cranium command which was an audio animatronic show uh you know both of those have you know not been around for you know decades and um so people fans you know seeing these photos of bob chapek and the imagineers looking at this pavilion uh has caused a lot of speculation in the theme park world that maybe they could be uh planning to bring wakanda to Epcot, uh, there's this uh, job posting internally on uh, Disney, uh, Disney's job listings looking for an interior designer for the Wonder of Life um, section of the park. And uh, it, it kind of hints that they're, you know, they're looking to desi- uh, design production of a shop slash restaurant or attraction. That's all it says. Uh, so we don't know what they're doing. It could just be a renovation to this old uh, aging uh, pavilion. But... Um, 
uh, I, I go down into the, you know, I'm not going to dive deep into this. If, if you go to slash from the com, you can read the whole thing, but I, about why there, it's such a complicated scenario because Universal Studios in Orlando has a section based on uh, Marvel and Marvel sold off their theme park uh rights when they were not doing too well before disney bought them and uh, a lot of the characters that are featured in the in the universal islands adventure park um are basically disney is not allowed to use them in florida or anywhere uh east of the mississippi um so uh so there's some confusion if black panther is included in that because there's some art um featuring black panther in in that park um, but, uh, what, if you've read this article, I, I go into theorizing that maybe they could build Wakanda in this pavilion without Black Panther. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, this could be a ride where you fly around Wakanda or something like that without actually it featuring the character of Black Panther. Maybe that's a loophole to get around it. There's other fan rumors saying that maybe, uh, the, the pavilion will be, uh, opened, uh, as a, uh, a tech exhibit because it looks like Epcot's getting rid of their interventions section and it could be like sponsored by the fictional country of Wakanda and it could like present like STEM inspired science fiction exhibits uh, kind of like uh, those are hinted at in the community centers at the end of the film. Uh, so we'll have to see if anything comes of this, but uh, it, you know, with, with over a billion dollars at the box office, I, I can't see a way that Disney isn't trying to figure out a way to let people enter Wakanda at one of these theme parks. Um, Peter, how long do you think something like that would take to construct? Are we looking at like three years from now, or is this like a 10 year project? Like what, how, how quickly do do they get things like this up and running? Well, it it depends on the size of the thing. Uh, If it's a full land, it could take uh, three to five years. Um, If it is, a ride i've seen them do that in i mean they 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 basically announced guardians of the galaxy mission breakout and that was done i think like less than a year later like six months mm-hmm. later or something uh but that was a retrofit of a existing attraction they do have motion simulators here from that uh that uh journey into the body thing which mm-hmm. maybe they could retrofit into a flying ride like i don't know it's it's like 20 30 year old technology at this point so i'm not <laughs> sure if they would want to do that um so it really depends like if, if it was going to be like that stem exhibit kind of thing i could see them doing that in the next year do you know what i mean like that's just a bunch of science exhibits yeah. um but uh if you're actually building wakanda <laughs> um you know, I think that would take a few years, but uh, you know they're trying to get another Black Panther movie out. What probably by twenty twenty or something? I, I know we've speculated about it on the site. They haven't announced a year, but um, anyways, you can go to slashfilm.com, dot com, read my whole article. It's going to be linked in the show notes. Uh, let's move on from that to Avengers: Infinity War. Uh, we have now confirmed that it is the longest film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Chris, tell us about it. Yes, yeah, so Avengers Infinity War is 156 minutes long, which is officially the longest film in the MCU. Uh, the previous record holder for that title was uh, Captain America's Civil War at 147 minutes, but this uh, surpasses that. And uh, the Russo brothers, when asked which of the characters would have the most screen time in the film, they they offered a surprising answer. Um one they said was Thanos, which I guess makes sense since all the Marvel films have pretty much been building towards that character's big debut here. And the other is Thor, which I was not expecting. So apparently Thor and Thanos have the biggest, uh, the most amount of screen time in Avengers uh, Affinity War. So there you have it. Hmm. I would not have suspected that Thor had such a big role in this upcoming film. Um, and uh if we're gonna we're gonna have to see why. I, I mean, when I was on the set of Avengers: Infinity War, I believe they they basically said this is this is as much an Avengers movie as it is Thanos's movie. It's 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 almost like a Thanos uh, standalone film. Uh, so that's gonna be interesting because Marvel has never really focused on their big baddies. Um, so we'll have to see. Uh, but let's move on from that to Westworld season two. Uh, we have found out the secret title which could provide some hints about what the second season will be about. Ben, what do we know? 
So Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy are the showrunners of Westworld. And internally, they have nicknamed each season of Westworld. Um, We know that the first Uh, The nickname of the first season is called The Maze, and now in a new interview with Entertainment Weekly, uh, the nickname for the second season has come to light. So uh, the quote from Jonathan Nolan is, if the first season was a journey inward, this is a journey outward. This is a search for what else is beyond the park and what else is in the park. Are there more parks? How big is the park? What's beyond the park? We think of our seasons as discrete components in the series to the point where we've named our seasons. The first season was called The Maze. The second season is called The Door. And right after that, Lisa Joy, who is his uh, writing partner and wife, uh, apparently exclaimed, I can't believe he just told you that to the interviewer. So I I don't know if that's uh, a big dramatic show for for the benefit of the interviewer to try to <laughs> convince him that he got something that he wasn't supposed to get because i would not put that past these guys they they are very attuned to yeah. the way the internet works after <laughs> the first season of westworld um or if that was a genuine reaction from her and she was very surprised that he revealed that bit of information so um you know the and it, and it one... doesn't mean it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it's a spoiler of any kind because jonathan nolan is very keeps things very close to the chest right yeah, yeah it's, so it's, it's, not... it's more of a metaphor than anything yeah. because uh season one being called the maze we know that there was a lot of maze imagery especially in the first half of season one um and it was it seemed to be that uh ed harris's man in black was really like searching for a literal maze in the park but it ended up being more of like a, a mental labyrinth um that was sort of a a metaphor for the discovery of consciousness for these uh, android hosts that are in the park. So the second season being referred to as the door doesn't really give us much of a uh, of a hint exactly uh, of what it will be about, other than well, sort of what I, I want to ask you a saying. question. Um, yeah, and you know, if you haven't watched Westworld season one, you might want to tune out for the next two minutes. Uh, I want to ask you: Do you think the door they're talking about is the door to Shogun World? that we saw in the end of the last season uh yeah that's what i was yeah i I think so because what nolan the other part of nolan's quote being like you know what is what else is here essentially um i think that sort of same metaphor could be applied to the title of the door in that these characters um who thought that they were in such a, a limited physical space are now realizing that they can extend beyond that area. So I I do think it's probably going to be, uh, yeah, one of the doors will lead there, and then another one may be, like, out of the park completely and out of Delos Incorporated's uh, entire, you know, overview, maybe just out into the world, like almost like an ex machina kind of scenario. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, after Season 2 wraps up, looking back on it, what we can sort of... uh, glean from that meaning so basically a bigger mystery box i know I, I know it was theorized in the first episode of the first season of westworld that maybe they could be on a different planet i'm, I'm interested to see if if that comes to light um yeah. but uh we'll have to see um the door to the spaceship that leads them to earth <laughs> Yes. Uh, let's move on to our, our last and final story, and that is Star Wars The Last Jedi. There is a novelization out right now that you can read. I'm listening to it on Audi- on, on Audible, um, which has all these sound effects and sa- uh, voices and uh, uh, music and stuff. It's great. Uh, but one thing this novelization is giving us is giving us a lot of explanations for stuff that uh, isn't really explained on the big screen. And um, I know in the past... When I was talking about The Last Jedi, I was kind of uh, annoyed that uh, Ray, being from nobody, not not that I don't like that idea, I, I do like the idea that she's not a chosen one, but her being from nobody might, um, it kind of makes her... I don't want to use the word Mary Sue, but like I know that's what Max uh, Landis was using in in that whole controversy. Because in Force Awakens, she basically just knows how to use a lightsaber and she knows how to use the Jedi mind trick without any Jedi training. I always assumed that you know she was nobody, but she had some Jedi training in her past. Maybe she was one of Luke's students uh, who survived or something. But uh, we found out in uh, the Last Jedi uh, that is not the case. Uh, so. But the book 
does explain how Ray g- learned the Jedi mind trick. Chris, tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, in the last Jedi novelization, um, there's a there's a, a little explanation about why exactly Ray knew how to use the Jedi mind trick. Um, for the record, I'm just going to say this has never bothered me, but I understand <laughs> it, it's it bothered other people. So if you know if you had a problem with it, here's your explanation. Um, you know, uh, you you might recall that in the scene before Ray using the Jedi mind my, mind trick, there's a scene where Kylo Ren is, you know, getting inside her mind to extract information out of her. So the book, uh, The Last Jedi Novelization, explains that while Kylo Ren was in her mind, she was, in turn, inside his mind as well. I mean, she didn't realize she was doing it, but because she's so Force-sensitive, she was able to basically read Kylo Ren's mind and learn about all Kylo Ren's powers. So because of that, she had a, a you know like a rudimentary understanding of what a Jedi mind trick was and how to use it. So there you have it. If that bothered you, there <laughs> is an explanation here. You got to drop the inception Brom noise in right here. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you, um, do you guys think that this was JJ Abrams original intention of how she learned the Jedi mind trick? Do you think, because he, well, here's the thing. I, I, um, you know, a lot of people that watch movies and they criticize movies, they, you know, they'll criticize a moment like that and they'll be like, did the director not even think about that? And I can tell you right now, the directors think about every single moment in a movie. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they spend so much time with this. So JJ must have had an explanation of how she knew the Jedi mind trick. Do you think this was actually it? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this exact answer, but I feel like from watching the movie the first time, this was more or less the conclusion I really sort of drew myself. I mean, I didn't put it into these exact words, but the fact that there was a, a scene directly before this of, you know, Kylo Ren getting inside her mind and she in turn seemed to, you know, be able to counter that, that sort of, you know, did the, the legwork for me. And I think that's why I, I was so accepting of it. But again, you know, I understand that some people did have a problem with this. And I do think this is actually a pretty good explanation. Ben, any thoughts? Um, I, if I had to guess, and this is based on (laughs) not very much, to be honest with you, I I don't think this is probably what JJ intended, but I feel like he, uh, left it vague on purpose because it didn't necessarily matter that much for his movie. And he, he sort of set it up for whoever came next, if they wanted to fill in the gap, then they could. And I think this is just a, a particularly clever way of Lucasfilm and the story group, uh, reverse engineering an explanation that, like Chris said, actually makes sense in this context. Um, I, you know, if if you asked me, uh, I think what you're really getting at, Peter, is uh, <laughs> when J.J. Abrams sat down to write The Force Awakens, we know he also came up with like a loose uh, a treatment for an entire trilogy. Was this part of that? I don't think so. No, yeah. um, I, I think if he had his way and if he was make, direct, writing and directing this entire trilogy, we would have seen a, a different explanation for this. But I think it works equally well, um, you know, in, in the context of, of what we do have. No, I, I do think it works very well. Um, I don't think this was his original intention. I, I, I honestly think J.J. intended Ray to be uh, the daughter of Han Solo uh, and uh, Leia in some way, and that was changed throughout production, um, and that was the remnant of that previous storyline. But we'll never know that because, you know, uh, they're not going to release a behind-the-scenes thing to explain uh, the making of that movie. Uh, so we'll, we'll just have to wonder and guess, but I, I, I like the explanation. The explanation is, is a fair explanation and it's, uh, certainly better than she just knew how to do the Jedi mind trick because, uh, I've argued with so many people that were like, thought that was a, the, that was a good storytelling bit <laughs> that she just like knew how to do it. And like with no training whatsoever, and I was like, no, uh, you know, People need to learn how to do those kind of skills. But anyways, um, 
That brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. Find all the stories we mentioned today on SlashFilm.com and linked in the show notes. Slash Film Daily is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, all your popular podcast apps. Uh, please feel free to send us an email, peter at SlashFilm.com. Leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention the email on the air. Please go rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Spread the word. Tell your friends. And we'll see you tomorrow.